In 1990, I moved to the University of Western Ontario, <coughs> in London, Ontario. Um, got lost on the road because I'd only been there by airplane and I had no idea where it actually was. Had no idea I had to go through, to Tor through Toronto to get there unless I took a ferry. Anyway, that was water long under the bridge. Um, it was, I accepted the position as department chair coming, I thought, to a department with a fairly firm commitment to what people then called symbolic anthropology, which I'm okay with. It's one of a number of names for qualitative ethnographic research that I'm comfortable with. <coughs> it turned out to be something which wasn't working quite that way. I also thought I was hired to move a very good master's program to the PhD level, and the dean of the day did not want to do that. So I ended up doing many things. I, well, first, we were going to have MA, biological and archaeological stuff. OK. So the department really went in a different direction, which meant I had to reinvent myself in a number of ways that I hadn't planned on, uh, which was OK. I did that. <coughs> but the children were, at that point, the oldest was 16. And that was the last time I could possibly have moved with all of them with me. And I would not have moved without them all with me. Trace said, maybe I could stay here to finish high school. And I said, well, you'll need a job. I'm not going to <laughs> pay room and board to one of your friends when you could eat my good cooking and stay home. And so he suddenly decided he was dying to see London, Ontario. The kid's comment was, I reserved 51% of the vote for me, but the kid's comment was that we've gone lots of places, that's okay, but we've always come home, meaning to the acreage outside Edmonton with our minor farming operations, and very minor. I think we entertained the local farmers for years with our antics. Anyway, so I made a deal with the kids that we would go back to Alberta the summer after our first year here and that they could visit their friends for a couple of weeks. And by the second summer, they, that was okay with them. And by the second summer, they didn't ask to go back. So I think we made the transition fairly smoothly as a family. And they all finished school here. Two of them still live in London and one outside Toronto. So um, it has been a, a commitment to stay where all of us have a home base and to keep the house because one of them is very good at building and fixing things and so it, it makes sense. And mom does Sunday dinner every week, still, and holiday meals. Anyway, so at Western, um, the first thing to do seemed to be to find out what native indigenous issues were like in this part of the country and I really didn't know what to expect because the communities I had worked in in Alberta were fairly isolated to quite isolated, depending on which of them. And I was all over the province in consulting on language revitalization and so on. <coughs> you couldn't get funding to do applied work in those days because it wasn't academic enough. So one had to, to seem to be doing theoretical things. And I always published enough of those kinds of things that I could continue working with middle-aged ladies on language programs. I was pretty sure that wasn't going to work. But one of the things I didn't expect that was a wonderful surprise was to find Lisa Valentine, now Phillips, um, as a colleague. She came a year before I did to Western and had worked in northern Ontario with Ojibwe in a very isolated community. And so we hatched a plan to apply for funding to work on English as spoken by Native people in southwestern Ontario, which was interesting for a couple of reasons. <coughs> One is that the language loss had been enormous in the sense of people not knowing the language anymore, and a lot of people living in urban areas 
or away from the reserve. And so there was a, a question of, of what kind of conservatism could one find. And then the other question is that there are two, and now we would say three, separate indigenous traditions that are powerful in the area around London. That is the Haudenosaunee at Six Nations. Finally got back to that after 30 odd years. And, well, no, 20 some, I guess. And then back to um, Algonquin, but Ojibwe, Anishinaabek, rather than Cree. And so there was a, a kind of, what are the differences? And it's almost the same question as my effort to study an Athabascan hunting and gathering tradition, to change one variable and see how different it feels. So the idea was that by contrasting the way things work with Haudenosaunee <coughs> and Anishinaabek people in this part of Ontario, that we would begin to get some sense of how those things had worked and that they would be consistent with the traditional hunter-gatherer tradition of the Anishinaabek or the Three Fires Confederacy, which also includes Potawatomi and Odawa and the Haudenosaunee. And then the third piece is, is the Lenape, Delaware, which is somewhat less prominent and kind of in between in lifestyle. But certainly the Haudenosaunee are, um, if not agriculturalists, they certainly have been horticulturalists for a very long time. And I think that that shows in the formality and timing and, and openness to things being structured that one does not find with the formerly nomadic groups of people whose subsistence depends on being able to shift the relevant at this moment social relations much more rapidly. So that has always seemed to me to be another important contrast when you're trying to understand how the group of people you come to know well fits within a larger context of other folks. So. Lisa and I had three successive shirt grants, the three-year standard grants things, usually four years apart, um, to pursue various aspects of this. The first was simply to document the, that there is a distinct form of English that goes all the way from phonology to um, pragmatics or semantics. Um, the second was focusing more on the use of language in particular contexts or institutions. And that was, by that point, we had a research team of interesting graduate students at the MA level. A number of them went on to do really interesting doctoral work elsewhere because we still didn't have that program. But I still consider some of them my students. I guess the most obvious would be um, Rob Wishart, who is now at Aberdeen, um, <coughs> who worked at Wapple Island for his master's. And that was a question of, okay, we've got this this thing where they hunt, okay, but it's rat, that is muskrat, and geese, uh, and ducks, and so on. Um, and to see how that would work differently in terms of the relationship of people and land. Um, and he did some interesting work along narrative lines. All of them were sort of between linguistic anthropology and social, none of them knowing much linguistics in the straightforward sense. Um, Teresa McCarthy, who is, is from Six Nations, um, is now at the University of Buffalo, continuing to do some similar kind of work. So there were some nice pieces that uh, no one, Kath Buttle from that period is at Manitoba now. Um, Wendy Lou Flynn was teaching at that funny little college in in Fort McMurray until they decided that they didn't need anything except tech sciences and fired their whole staff, which gave her a great pension. Anyway, they were a good bunch um, in a good many kinds of ways. And so we, did, we didn't publish a lot out of that for a variety of reasons <coughs> having to do with the collaboration, but there was a lot of good work done. And then I moved rather gradually into wanting to talk about what I called nomadic legacies, that is, the relationship between language and land and people's sense of identity. 
Um, and what I mean by that is that I think that there's a real problem with public perception that reserves are no longer necessary, many members of the public's perception, because over 50% of indigenous people do not live on a reserve. Now that has a little bit to do with the definition of status Indians and the inclusion of Métis and Inuit and so on. So it's a it's an inflated figure in many ways. But in many other ways, half of the approximately half of the population of any band registration will not be living there at a given moment. So the obvious response is, well then so what? They're just they will merge into the general population. That has not happened so far and it's not going to. And then because the sense of identity is something that is to be maintained. They don't, many of the people who live in the city do not speak their traditional languages, or if they do, it's a few sort of, hi guys, how are you? Thank you, please. No, 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 but thank you, certainly. Um, there's some ritual use of the language, but not much fluency at all in, among younger people in this area. And the other thing, of course, is that the diet is largely indistinguishable most of the time from uh, from other urban residents, high on pizza and other junk food. Okay, now, does that make someone cease to be indigenous? And the short answer for anyone that, that is familiar with communities or, or with people will say, no, obviously it does not. So I began to work on it from a demographic point of view. There are supposedly, give or take, 10,000 Native people living in London, and that number has been pretty stable for most, essentially for the time that I have been in the city. Um, however, and my colleagues in sociology say it doesn't matter to them, they're not the same 10,000 people every year, and that's critical because it means that people go back and forth, that you make decisions about where you're going to live at one point in your life or your career. So someone will come to the city to go to school, to take a job, to access social services or, or medical services particularly that aren't available at home, and then they will go home at other points. Or they will leave the kids with the grandparents on the res and come in to do whatever they do, and everybody will move back and forth. Or the people who live in the city go home frequently to their home communities. So I began to take to talk about the importance of the home place as a place of belonging, whether one is present on it or not. When you meet an indigenous person, the first thing you're going to do is spend some time negotiating where are you from. And you're going to keep negotiating till you hit someone you've both heard of. Even if it's the Prime Minister of Canada, you just, you have to find a link so that you know where to put that other person. And it's not in terms of where, it doesn't, the question isn't where are you living, it's where are you from? And that from is the thing that ties you to, to a place and to a particular local version of the Anishinaabek tradition. I've worked largely on that side of, of the um, cultural variability. And so, what it seems important to talk about is the process of decision making whereby people go to the resources they need as opposed to the logic of the larger society that says let's drag home the cave bear we just bashed over the head and put a fence around our, our cave so that we can have our settledness. And given the enormous resistance of mainstream Western society to the nomadic or quasi-nomadic um, residential patterns of indigenous peoples around the world, it seems really clear that this is a divide that needs to be understood more clearly. It doesn't mean you aren't tied to land. In fact, it may mean that it probably means that you're tied much more intensely to land but you use a wide range of places. The traditional territory extends a long way from the home place. 
and there is a seasonal exploitation cycle that, that will take you to a lot of other places where you will overlap with the land use of other groups, and our legal system still can't seem to understand that one. So there's a whole lot of stuff about the rational decision-making um, approach to life and to sustainability of social and natural world react relationships that I think needs to be rethought in anthropology and Canadian society and certainly in terms of indigenous policy. Um, so I have yet to complete the book-length treatment of that, but I've published at least half a dozen papers dealing with aspects of the argument. And we've had another, a second-generation research team of sorts that has worked along with some of those issues and I think done some, some really interesting work. So that has been a question of, of trying to argue for the the, pers the persistence of traditional indigenous culture in modernity or post-modernity, if you must. Um, and I think that's really important. I tie it very closely to oral tradition and the transmission of knowledge from particular people that you know who they are. Um, and so, for example, when we talk to our research ethics board, they want us to, to be... Um, they want our informants, which is a word I hate, to be anonymous. And I, you can't say that to an indigenous person because they're not going to know whether they need to take something seriously until they know who said it and whether they have any respect for that person or that person's expertise to talk about that issue. And so there are just whole sets of things in which cross-cultural miscommunication has been a, a major issue. And cross-cultural miscommunication is the best summary I can give of, of how the things in my field work in various, in linguistics, in um, social anthropology and health studies have all somehow been about the same thing. And it's how can we think about this in its own terms and therefore be able to respond to it in ways where we can come up with something some consensus which doesn't make the parties identical, it simply makes them able to agree that we can move forward by doing this, I for one reason and thou for another, and that that's okay. Um, that has not been the tenor of indigenous relations to the state in Canada, to put it mildly. And so I think there is a huge educational function that good ethnography can provide um, in, in policy, in law, in education, um, access to the legal system. It goes through anything one might want to talk about. And I think these kinds of, of discussions have to be made more publicly. Obviously, Native people can speak for themselves, and I, we seem to understand that better than when I began my career in our society. But it's still remarkable how often one of my indigenous colleagues, collaborators, friends can say something and nobody pays the slightest bit of attention to it and I say the same thing and they say, oh, that's very profound. Um, the whole point is, <laughs> you want to know about this, let me introduce you to an indigenous person who won't bite you and who knows a lot about that because it's based on their experience. And so it, it's been that kind of directional movement. The most intensive particular community relationship that I got engaged in in that stretch was with Walpole Island First Nation, um, where the Cultural Heritage Center, founded by Dean Jacobs, who holds three honorary doctorates in um, environmental studies, largely, um, has kept a very open position about um, collaborating with researchers in a way that is controlled by the community. And I've learned a great deal from Dean about how to go about these things, and he's just a really quite remarkable person, as well as a good friend. Um, we began to talk more and more in these years about collaborative research and about the ways in which we 
redefine the role of, of the researcher in relation to communities. I think that the leading edge in anthropology on these kinds of issues is the study of indigenous North Americans because there they are reading it over your shoulder and if they hate it, you're going to have to deal with it now. And you should have already had those conversations before it gets to a point of being seen that way. And I think that's been a, a tremendous, it's been of tremendous importance, and it's something that I've taken into my work in, in other contexts as well, particularly with rewriting the research protocols as a member of the American Philosophical Society Native American Advisory Council on behalf of the APS, of which I am a member. Um, it, but most of the members of that committee are indigenous people from around North America where there are documents at the APS about their people. And so we've been able to use those lessons from the ethnography to try and make a much more general kind of plan for tailored to each community's particular understanding of their needs um, agreements, usually MOUs, between the APS and, and various communities. I'm still very much involved in that process and will continue to be. Um, how, sorry, how are we doing in time? Oh, all right. We could go a little further with that. Then the, <coughs> um, the question of how you generalize out from that, I suppose, there are some things that are certainly part of what goes on at, at the University of Western Ontario. Um, a former dean apparently heard a rumor that I was thinking of leaving Western, and I want to make it clear that I did not start that rumor, although I did play with a job interview in that period, but I don't think anyone knew it. I didn't think that anyone at Western ever knew that, and I wouldn't have taken the job if offered, but it was at Harvard, and that amused me, so I thought I'd go talk to them. It was a disaster. They didn't want me any more than I wanted them, but that's okay. In Canadian studies, but based in anthropology, um, at least one of the other two people they interviewed didn't want it either. I don't know about the third, but what happened was that they decided not to hire an anthropologist after all. Um, okay, fine. Um, I'm not sure it was a particularly good thing. But anyway, the dean of the day said, what could we do to make you happy? And I remember Tony Wallace who said he had one of those conversations when he was at Penn, and he said, well, we need a new museum building, and they built him one. So I said, well, you know, we're 30 years behind the rest of the country. We need a Native Studies program. And he said, okay, write me a curriculum. We'll start <laughs> next year and phase it in. I, okay. So I went out and no other instructions. So I went out and found some colleagues on campus, indigenous where possible, but there weren't enough to make a committee. Um, the indigenous services director and two people from the university's indigenous council. And then we sat down and wrote a curriculum. Well, largely I wrote and they edited, but in any case, we put together something for the following year, beginning with the first year course. And I served as the founding director with a mandate of putting myself out of business and hiring an indigenous director, which I did. I'm very pleased by that process. And it really was way, way, way overdue and has, I think, worked out very well. We've tried to have relationships of various kinds to the home communities, largely in this part of Ontario. So largely the, the three groups that are, are from this area. But they have also been very open-minded hosts to, um, to people from other traditions who are guests in this territory for the moment. And I think, again, that that has worked out very well indeed. We have just at Western completed and ratified a, an indigenous strategic plan, which is quite detailed and commits the university quite strongly to being much more serious about the community-based relationships that, that should be maintained. Our Indigenous Council is a combination of a small number of people from Western 
and a large number of people from local communities and organizations. I am the only person to have served in it, on it since its foundation in 1991. Institutional memory personified. Um, but I think that we are working out ways of, of helping the administration understand why we often don't communicate well across that boundary. And that has been a really exciting process to be part of.